They call us Mohawks, but in our language we are Ungwehunwe, the real people or original people of these lands. The reestablishment of Ganyaga territory was led by the Ganyaga or Ungwehunwe of the land of the Flint. Our recent history is one of ethnocentric subjugation, genocide, and attempted assimilation by peoples of a foreign land. At Kanyonge, we understand that our continued survival is dependent on restoring the connection to creation that the ancients instinctively understood. Our ancestors had swayed from the path of peace once before. They, however, were able to re-establish a peaceful cooperative society, a society under a multinational constitution of laws known as the Gayanaret Goa. The Ungwehunwe at Kanyonge territory are determined to see this peace restored once again. We pledge to our children's children and their children that they will not have to walk in darkness if they continue to follow the customs, laws, and traditions of their ancestors. Our traditional territory, the land to which we are rooted, we call Ganyonge or Land of the Flint. This land includes those areas referred to as the Mohawk River Valley in central New York, northward to the St. Lawrence River Valley in southern Quebec, and eastward into the Green Mountains of Vermont. As traditional Indians, we honor our past and preserve our future by following the customs, laws, and traditions of our ancestors. Our path is guided by Guyana Goa, also known as the Constitution of the Six Nations Confederacy. In 1974, a vanguard of Ganyokehaga traditionalists established a council fire at an abandoned Girl Scout camp near Moss Lake. We, we didn't pick any, any place, you know, if it's private. We went to where the state lands are. We didn't know there was a, <coughs> it was a girls' camp. All we seen was the gatehouse and two outbuildings. And when we went inside, and that's when we seen the, it was a girls' camp, and there was a lot there, a lot of buildings. But mostly just a shell, they weren't insulated. We found out a little while after we got there that the state was going in there to demolish all the, all the houses, all the buildings that were in there. <clears throat> so we, just, we got there just in time. The council fire issued a manifesto notifying New York State and others they would resist any attempts to remove or disturb them from the free use and enjoyment of their land. New York State filed a federal lawsuit to have them ejected from the property. After the federal court ruled in favor of the Gnocchi Hirono, Governor Hugh Carey appointed Ogden Reed, former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, to negotiate a settlement with the council fire. Reed was later replaced with Secretary of State Mario Cuomo, Louis Grummet served as special assistant to the Secretary of State. We knew that to get a settlement, it had to involve land. They wanted a piece of land where they could be safe and left alone. Uh, what they were looking for was something they could be self-sufficient on, away from any center of white population, uh, where they could basically follow their own laws, their own educational programs, and raise their own families, where they could hunt and where they could fish. They wanted to be safe. Lots of people were involved and we tried to put together a deal that would last for decades of centuries. Certainly not for months or weeks. It takes uh, minutes to blow up a deal like that and months to years to put it back together. We didn't want to do that again. At that time, uh, we spoke at length with the Clinton County Legislature. We spoke at length with the state senator from that area. We spoke sh briefly with the assemblyman from that area. This wasn't a surprise. The deal involved moving the Kanyokehaga settlement to the area referred to as Clinton County. The plan, in the words of Secretary Cuomo, would have no legal effect on the claims or treaty rights of the Six Nations, the Mohawk Nation, the people of Kanyonge, or the state of New York. Without waiving their political and legal claims, the Council Fire in the state agreed to solicit religious, civic, and political leaders to serve on the Turtle Island Trust, a charitable trust that would presume to hold titles and leases to lands occupied by the Gnocchi Hirono. 
Um, I was involved in setting, making sure the trust was set up. It was very much in the state interest. We did not want to return to the issue of who owned the land. And as long as the Turtle Island Trust was willing to hold the land as a nonprofit in trust for the, uh, the use of the Mohawks, we thought that was a perfect issue. And so we went to the state solicitor general, spent many hours in the state solicitor general's office, making sure that the attorney general personally signed off on this trust. Every tool was in place to ensure the longevity of this deal. That was important not only to the state of New York and to the Mohawk Nation as they represented themselves through Ganyanga, it was also important in our judgment to the people of Clinton County. The entire state of New York, from the governor's office, the attorney general's office, the charities unit and the secretary of state's office, uh, and indeed the environmental conservation office and the office of general services, Every one of us, those agencies, signed off because they believe the state purpose in bringing peace and harmony to the North Country for the long range. The Ganyak Gehrono have honored their Pledge of Peace. All Umkwehungwe who desire to live according to their traditional ways and abide by the Gayanere Goa are welcome to take shelter within our territory. My uncle, when I was young, he talked about a place that was what this place is. and. Um, and when I, I always carried that, what, what he told me about um, finding a place and being secluded and uh, take care of our own and uh, doing our own business and just being grateful for everything. Everything is here. Um, you know, this, this long house that we're in, you know, it's a representation, it's where we hold our, our ceremonies and our acknowledgement to the world around us, um, which is everything in our, our, our teachings. One of the things that really touched me about in the beginning was that um, the community here, there's a core group of people who every morning they do acknowledgement with, uh, with our sacred tobacco and uh, that really got me. I meet them by the fire every day and I said, I, I can't believe it. I said, I, I'd been doing this by myself for a long time and, and I found people that do it too and I really appreciate it. If we give daily thanks for the gifts around us, if we stay in harmony with ourselves, with others, and with our natural environment, this helps the mind and body to remain strong and healthy. All these thousands of years that our people have been here, this is what we live by. This is what was handed down to us. What us, what we, we believe in, and, and what <coughs> is what we use, what we see. It's the natural world. And this is where we get life from. You know, people, all they do is pray. They want this, they want that. Us, we don't pray. We give thanks to what, what's here, what creation has put here. This is what <coughs> we're, we're connected to because everything is alive. That's where, we, so we, got, we have to respect that. And that's all it is. We just say, Nyao, thank you. The way we work with the natural world um, for hunting and fishing, as Ungwenhua people, we're supposed to work with nature. We're supposed to work together with them and we're, um, we don't want to take away from them as well because they're living beings as well as us. And if we take away from them, we're only hurting ourselves later on in the future. So all this land that we have, like I mentioned before, I'd say 85 to about 90% 90, 90 of Ganyangi is forested. There's no type of development on it. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't use it. Um, all our animals that we use for hunting, like deer, um, moose, sometimes bear, as well as smaller animals like um, beavers and raccoons, things like that, um, they live on that land and we see that as a food source. And in order to keep that food source, we have to keep our, our forests the way they are. So we, don't, we, don't, we try not to develop them that much. We tell our children to be stewards of the land. 
We tell them the earth is a bowl from which we all share in its bounties. We share one spoon. Take our share and pass the spoon along to the next generation, always leaving something in the bowl for those who will follow. This is just a small piece of what, of, um, of what our ancestors used to use. So uh, ownership and all this, there's, there's none of that. You know, it, it belongs to the future. They're not even here yet. It's our job to, to uh, try to preserve the land the best we can and show, you know, show them how the younger ones, like she's talking about when they're young, start teaching them when they're young so, so they can take over and continue. Reode was born, raised, and educated in Ganyange. It's very important for Ganyange to preserve and uh, keep their way of life because we're very proud of who we are, um, where we came from, and where we're going to go. And it's still, it's a lot, it's a learning process. A lot of our culture had been lost in the past, um, and the purpose of Ganyange was to come together for our culture, to rebuild it back to its uh, former state before uh, colonization. Being the youngest of 14 in our language um, was, they always spoke, my mother and father always spoke the language. But by the time I was born, being the youngest, I didn't learn my language as well because my mother started uh, speaking English, Kihasa, more too, because the kids were getting hit in school, like her, seeing her kids being punished for speaking the language. So it became, like less important, she didn't want them to get punished for speaking. I have I have a real passion about the language, and I really want this. I really want the language to come back. Each of the each of the classes have has a different approach to you know teaching the language. Some like to um, just converse, you know, talk, and not really have any any written material. Um, so that's their approach. Others like to to write. Um, myself. In the class right here uh, is what I, I, I teach adults, um, the language, and our approach is basically starting right at the bottom, like ground level and working our way up as, as if they were like um, little babies. So we start right at the bottom with basic sounds and then work our way up. The muscles that you use in, a, in your throat to speak Mohawk are completely different than English, and um, the muscles in my throat had to become used to the movement in order to speak the language. Um, the reason why we decided to do some of the adults is because we want the adults to be able to speak back to the children that are learning over here as well. You know, if the children are speaking the language, but the, the adults don't know what is being said to them, how they're supposed to, you know, talk, talk to each other. So trying to get the children and the adults at the same time speaking. <laughs> We have created a self-sufficient community with a cooperative economic system that values the welfare of the collective good. If somebody's in, in trouble, they need food or, you know, <coughs> that <they> can't <coughs> help themselves. So you, you're there, you help them. They're human too, you know, so we have to take care of each other because you never know down the road, you might need that help too. There is no economic or social class void amongst the people, as the community's resources and institutions are shared and governed by the people equally. We all share everything, like we all eat at the cocos and we all help with the work, you know, the workload. When it's time to get the gardens ready, then we, 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 we work and there's people that are right on top of it and then pull all the boys because I work with my uh, sons and I got some of the nephews and uh, there's different ones in the community and then we, we start working together to get this together, uh, get the gardens ready and then uh, make the rows and, um, and uh, bury in, you know, different ones in the community too. We, uh, Get, get everything all together and then we go in, in a force and a workforce and we join together and um, we start putting the seeds down and then and then they start coming up and then uh, raising that stuff and then you know when it's time to hill the potatoes or pick the bugs or or uh, weed the gardens and hoe we come and help them so that it's not all left on just some people to take care of everything we all join together it's really good that we're able to use our own foods and uh kitchen when we're cooking. Uh, there's a good feeling about having your own food that you can 
that you harvest it yourself. You planted those seeds and you can harvest it and bring it in and you can cook it for everybody. And you know it's healthy and for everyone to eat. I don't know, it's just um, it's something that makes me real happy that we're able to, to, to do that. It's like that yes. self-sufficiency. Our, our diet has um, really changed since we've been here in Ganyanga because we raise our own meat and because we plan our own food and we're eating our own food and all winter the women are putting that food away. It's really changed and, and health-wise and it, it feels so good that, um, you know, that goes back to uh, self-sufficiency and independence and having our own legs and uh, and that's all, we're not asking from, for anything from anybody about what we're doing. We just, we roll up our sleeves and we, we, uh, we work together as a unit and put this thing together, put the seeds on and raise that stuff. All of our food, it's really good. Well, you can see all these dryers that we, we, we have here. Um, what we do is we try to cut up um, a lot of our um, produce that we get from our gardens in the year. Um, we try, for the most part, to dry it as opposed to canning it because it's more of a traditional, more of a traditional thing to um, dry our foods and put it away. So we have these dryers, and I'm thinking hopefully someday in the future we have uh, larger ones. But this works for now. Um, we we dry our our um, squashes in there. Um, we dry peas and beans, whatever we need to dry at the time. Sometimes. Um, They'll even boil potatoes on the stove, mash them up, make some mashed potatoes and boil it. So when it dries, you can put it away and it acts as like, um, like chips. We know, we know all the methods uh, that our ancestors used to do, um, but you know, drying, we're trying to relearn a lot of this stuff. And because we lost a lot in the past, um, we're trying to relearn it, re ex uh, experiment with different methods and seeing what works for us. And, so that's why we're, we got all this, we, that's why we built this building dedicated to preserving our foods and putting it away um, the way that we used to and that, that we, the way that works for us today. And all the foods we eat are more natural. For the most part, we try to stick with our own foods and I think that does make a difference. Uh, you know, organic uh, foods that you raise yourself, you, you put that energy from, you know, from everything that you are into raising those foods and that makes a difference in the quality of the food beyond just getting them in a supermarket. So just the foods in themselves create a different uh, energy, a different, you know, health. And you see it in the people, you know, some people, they're almost ageless. So I, I believe that uh, if you get back to your basics, right to the roots, your food, organic food, clean water, those are your basic things you need. Clean air, clean water, clean food. If you have that, then the body is going to heal itself. And then it's all clean. You can't have disease in the clean system. The Holistic Health Center, um, we built that a few years ago so we can go back to our natural medicines, so we can research, research our own natural medicines that we use for our own people. And um, it's also available to the public. Uh, and we know that on the outside, like uh, outside of Ganyange, a lot of things aren't given to the people or, or the people aren't aware of, and, um, of you know, natural cures, I guess you could say, or uh, holistic medicines that we have that definitely help people in a big way. The average dose for one person of bark from a tree is about six inches square. Why do you think I told you to pick on this side and not on the other side? Because if you pick on that, you pick on that side, the sun's brighter on this side, the east. It comes up over there and goes around like this. So all on this side would be the good part of the tree. The lands that we use to harvest maple sap in our, our maple sap operation, the, the sugar house that we have, um, we built that a few years ago so we can, again, get back to the land, um, start doing our traditional ways um, of collecting sap. Um, we boil it down for our own personal use and whatever excess that we get, we will bring it to the Trade Center and uh, sell it there.
The amount of sap that we, we do produce depends on the day. On a very good day, we might get close to a thousand gallons. On a bad day, it can, get, it can be as much as 150 or even less. Uh, so it all depends on the weather and everything that we do is dependent on nature, so it's not consistent. It's like, uh, it's like an old tradition, you know, like uh, it's a community uh, event for, for us in the springtime. It uh, brings us closer together and so it's the sap from the tree that, that we use for medicinal purposes. It, it cleans your body out and uh, purifies your, your, your blood and all that. This is a community where people think of the we instead of the me. This is particularly true among our young people. One of the most important moral achievements the community has made is keeping alcohol and drugs out of our territory. The zero tolerancy for drugs and alcohol in Ganyanga started way back in 1974 when Ganyanga was first established in Moss Lake. Um, at that time, zero tolerancy was no, no alcohol whatsoever in the camp of Ganyanga. So over time that has evolved to um, different stages and to the stage it is today where we have an absolute zero tolerance um, because we feel that it hurts it hurts us as a community and it hurts the generations that are coming, the kids. And that's what Ganyaga was established for, for, for the future generations, for the children. On the reservations, young people are exposed to poverty, drugs and alcohol. They see no hope for a better future. They look to others to find self-esteem. What I've witnessed here is just incredible. I've seen, you know, some of the young men and women go from you know, teenage years to adult and there's nobody like them. They're just, you know, I'm just, I can't express, I can't even find words to express how, what I see in that, the strength they have um, and what's instilled in them. Our nation would be stronger if all of our young people could follow the path taken by the youth of Ganyanga territory. We are moving forward together we do not look outside of the community for support. We are becoming self-sufficient and independent, as our ancestors were. We have found our path by returning to our traditions, our values, and our way of life. That's what we have to look out for, is for the future, future generations. Because everything what we have, you know, it was uh, created for people to live in peace, to share. That's what that, <clears throat> the two row wampum is about. Not to tell people, different nations, this is what you have to do. You know, you respect their, their ways and you expect them to respect uh, your ways. So that way we can go walk down uh, the roads together. We're just living here and we're going we're gonna to continue. We're not going to go anywhere, you know. We were born here, we live here. This is, this is uh, it's our mother. We're um, going to keep giving her thanks and uh, sharing our life with her.
action.